Hey everybody, welcome to VTS. I forget which number this is. It's there's a lot of them. We're <coughs> we're getting up there, you know. We're doing a lot of these. Anyways, I uh, hope everybody has had a great holiday season so far. Um, and what we're gonna do, as as discussed, is we're gonna get into our next topic, which, as you can see by the screen, uh, which would be right there, cartoon animation. All right. Um, popular topic. I've done a lot of study on this stuff in the last couple of years trying to figure out how to ha how to make it happen in CG and so what we're gonna do is kinda go over this and and really try to break it down and understand what works what doesn't work the very significant differences between true cartoon animation and more of the stylized mm, realism issues kinda stuff that we've been doing in CG pretty much since the start um, <coughs> So, um, our, I don't know how many videos this is going to take. It'll take as many as it takes. And we're going to cover three basic ideas. Um, we're going to cover, first off, we're going to cover, I'm looking at my notes here, um, you know, basic concepts and fundamentals. Okay, what I mean by that is we're looking at what, what makes cartoon animation significantly different or unique from again the the standard feature film CG style animation that we've come to know and love and appreciate and expect uh, when we go to the movie theaters and plunk down our X number of dollars to watch a film um, there are pretty significant differences in the concepts and the fundamentals and we're going to kinda dip in and out of studying each of these things as we go along um, the other thing we'll we'll be looking at is we'll we'll do some actual honest analysis okay we'll look at some uh, cartoon animation some older classic stuff and we'll take a look at it compare it to and contrast it against stuff that's being done today or s stuff of a similar style in order to avoid any silliness with copyrights and stuff like that I will endeavor to use stuff that is um, well that's mine to work with okay I made it so uh, but it's done in that particular style. But it's really about taking a look at what's different um, and also what's the same. What what does carry over and what doesn't carry over. Because a lot of stuff doesn't work. Um, I learned this the hard way. I tried a lot of experiments, just a lot of tinkering on my own, and I find out um, a lot of stuff just doesn't work. You think it would work, and a lot of the the rules or a lot of the right way to animate that we're told by various voices of authority in the animation today um, are not absolute. Uh, sometimes the right way to do things is the wrong way. And so we're going to take a look at that and take a look at some of these kind of paradoxes of, of animation with, when it comes to cartoon animation. Okay, And then the third thing we'll look at ultimately is, you know, just hands-on examples, um, you know, of techniques and approaches. Okay, the idea here is to show you. Okay, this is this is this is what works. Okay, this is what works. This is what doesn't work. Um, so <clears throat> that's those are going to be our three guidelines as we go through. I'm not going to just do a block on just fundamentals and, and concepts. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to do just a block on analysis, and I'm not going to do just a block on hands-on techniques. They're going to kind of blend together, so each video is going to have a little bit of each. Okay. Um, again, don't know how many videos this is going to take. It takes as many as it takes, and we do what we need to do. Okay. Um, getting into the uh, the concept con idea um, is a good place to start. The the thing I want to talk about this this first video is is something that I've really done a lot of study on and it's very important that I've come to understand it's like the it's the it's the it is the absolute bedrock foundation of what makes cartoon animation different but also how it can work in CG and I and I call it visual harmony okay I've written a lot of blog posts about this um, where I kinda kinda I sort of hit at the idea, but I'll never sit down and really explain it super thoroughly. Um, another word that some people have used is cohesiveness. Okay, and this this concept is pretty simple. 
it's that everything in the scene in everything that you're watching on the screen has to be has to work together okay um, and breaking it down there's a couple of things you know there's there's any number of elements in a scene that are kind of you know especially in CG these elements kind of come together but they're also existent in other um, forms of animation as well uh, one is character design okay just what is the character you know what does their shape look like how how naturalistic is this shape um, how much attention is given to silhouette um, in a graphical element and and you know th th these are questions there's character design uh, there's what I would call material and texture all right which is different than light and shading and we can kind of get into that in a minute here and there's motion or movement okay and then the last one is what I'll call for lack of anything else acting okay these are all elements that uh, character when I say character design there's also you could also put in there world props okay those are aspects as well these these are your your building blocks of any animated image okay and they all work either when when it's working well they all work together they all kind of say the same thing okay and if you take a look at each of these elements, there's the one, two, three, four, five, six or so. Um, if you take a look at these elements, they go anywhere on a continuum. The continuum is like a graph, you know, it'll go from fully abstract on one scale to complete realism on the other scale. Okay? So from one end to the other, somewhere in here, you want your elements to kind of play in a certain range. And not necessarily find a, a specific spot, but you want them to be in the same range. Okay. Um, and generally, animation is more successful, is, con is perceived to be a higher quality by audiences if all those elements work together in the same general range of abstraction versus realism. Um, totally abstract is like, okay, finger smudges on paint with weird clinking noises from music, okay? Hard to talk about that. So there's a point, w you know, that's kind of off the scale here. There's a point where that just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but down here in this abstract realm, UPA animation. Okay, United Production Artists, very popular in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, you know, character designs were extremely simplified. Um, a lot of them didn't have any, um, didn't didn't have anything really significant going on as far as like trying to really represent things. Uh, projects, you know, like Gerald McBoing Boing and Rudy Toot Toot and Plunk Whistle. Lincoln Boom, or I think that's the Disney one. I can't, I can't remember the name of it because I was, I'm always thinking of clack and clink and stuff. But it's some, you know, it's the music one. These are, these are good examples of, um, of abstracted design in all these in the character design, the world design, the material and textures, uh, light, shadow, and shading motion, acting, all of these things were more abstracted. They were not realistic in any way whatsoever. Put it this way. You weren't, no one would ever look at those things and say, well, yeah, that looks like a photograph. Okay? Never intended to. On the far other end of the scale, you know, when you're doing visual effects that matches with live action, you know, these hybrid movies, um, Avatar, which just recently came out, is an is an example of stuff that strives to be extremely realistic um, in in a lot of ways. And of course, it's pretty fanciful in a lot of other areas. You know, with the character and the creature and the, the fauna and foliage. You know, 
it's interesting. I like that they choose to explore a world that doesn't doesn't exist, but they make one that is plausibly existing. Okay, because they they understand that realism is very necessary. Um, other examples would be something um, like Lord of the Rings trilogy. Um, again, there's fantastical elements in there, and you know the orcs and the creatures and the trolls and things like that. But a lot of that stuff, you know, it's blending with photography and film so it has to hold up on this re realism realm getting away from those hybrid films that's kind of like that's off the scale you know the hybrid films where you're using a lot of CG effects and elements is kind of like the opposite end of the super abstract you know paint smears and clicking noises okay they're kind of outside the realm of exactly what I'm talking about but in here um, you know your higher end features like uh, Ratatouille is a good example I think of a film that falls pretty high up in the realism sense. It's not it's not trying to fool anybody into thinking it's a photograph, but there's a lot of re there's a lot of reliance on stuff being very I mean if you just took a, a a picture, a still render of the kitchen from the film, um you know, it, it it's plausible that a person could think that's a photograph because the just the way of all the things working together if you take the characters out the characters are kind of one of these things so we've got this we've got this kind of range and anywhere along in here you can kind of play along okay um, you know like ice age is maybe somewhere right around there okay maybe somewhere right around there all right Shrek maybe somewhere around there um, Disney 2d efforts from uh, let's say Bambi is probably around here. Um, Warner Brothers stuff is probably you know somewhere around there, depending on which ones you get. If you get um, you know some of the richer environments, you know like Tom and Jerry's earlier stuff is kind of in this range as well. So it's all kind of in this. You, but what you want is you need all of these elements: the character design, the lighting, the shading, the materials, all these things. They all need to be in this range. As long as they are, then everything is okay. The audience just accepts it for what it is, which is why, as, as terrible as it looked to professionals in the business, a film like Hoodwinked, which actually was kind of imaginative in its storytelling, a film like Hoodwinked was consistently low quality, and audiences ate it up. I, I don't have another explanation for it. I mean, when I say consistently low quality, I don't mean... It, it just means that the anti-aliasing wasn't that good. The, you know, all the all these elements going into it were... Eh. They were done by inexperienced people under a hurry with no budget. You know, I think they made that film... The production budget on that film was like a million and a half dollars. You know, for a 90-minute film made by a bunch of students in, in a house in the Philippines. Okay, that's what you got. The thing is, because everything existed there, eh, people accepted it for what it was. Uh, another film that's recently come out is Wes Anderson's The Fantastic Mr. Fox. As a story, I mean, it, it's a typical Wes Anderson film, which sometimes doesn't sit right with me, because I'm like, huh? But aside from that, it's consistent. Okay, It had a kind of a Rankin-Bass, stop-motion-y, very limited kind of homespun, folksy kind of feel to it. And because everything in the film, all those elements, the character design, all those things, the motion, the type of acting, all that stuff, worked there, it worked. Okay? Um, another example would be the stuff that Ardman does, like Wallace and Gromit. Again, everything fits together. It's that harmony. Everything is singing the same song, and you have different notes, but they all blend together. The problem comes when you have something somewhere else. Uh-huh, okay. So, what we've tried to do in the past with CG animation is, for cartoons, is we've done the typical stuff up here, okay? We've made our shading, our lighting, our texturing, our model design. Um, we've, we've done all these things with very lush, you know, we've got self-shadowing, we've got, uh, uh, you know, soft shadows, subsurface scattering, uh, high texture density, you know, 
and it just we we're taking all these things we'll do refractions and 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 just all the stuff that we spend years trying to accomplish i mean there was a, a space of about 15 years from the mid 90s early 90s to about you know 2005 where sigraph every year was just like what are we going to find now okay what are we going to get what realistic thing are we going to get now that we can finally do in the software um so the, this is what i call the sigraph years okay all the sigraph stuff has been here but for some reason we thought well but we want to do cartoon stuff so down here we put we put the motion well even that i would say that the motion that was we'll kind of get into that in a second down here we would put character design and the acting okay and to some degrees the motion all right so we had this disconnect where the visual representation on the screen told us expect lush full fully explained fully rendered details and subtleties in all these areas and then the motion didn't live up to that and we walk away thinking well that that didn't work okay um, examples of films like this would be uh, I'm trying to think one off the top of my head like um, like Valiant okay for what it was worth you know it was a good effort but it was obvious that the people were far more comfortable doing the textures and all this stuff. I mean, it, it had it had its limitations there because of budget and stuff like that. But that's where it lived, is in that it tried to emulate that Pixar style, but the acting and the character design and and the animation just it just didn't have enough going for it. Aside from the story problems and and all these other stuff like that. But I mean, but it, it there was kind of it was kind of scattered. You had aspects of of that show which were just all over the board. They were everywhere. You know, it was just some here, some there. You would mix in a really abstract kind of model shape, but you would texture it realistically, and it just didn't work together. Um, and this this is where a lot of films fall down. Trying to do, you know, they try to emulate Pixar's success by going over here and. And then, but where they can't spend the money, they put other things, you know, somewhere along the line down here. So a, a, a chunk of the film ends up in this realm, but pieces are kind of lagging behind, and it just doesn't feel cohesive. So there's a reason why a Pixar or a DreamWorks or a Blue Sky film costs as much money as it does, because to make everything fit up here costs a lot of money. Okay, it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. Uh, a typical animator on a Pixar film is going to, in the course of the 14 to 18 months of animation, do about a minute's worth of work. Okay, a minute's worth of animation. Some will do more, some will do less, but a minute's worth of animation on a you know, minute to a minute and a half, for a year, or more. Okay, that's a lot of manpower. A lot of that's a lot of overtime. So you, you think about that. Spread that out. A minute's not very long. I mean, a student film is a minute, and you got to do it in less than a semester, well, along with all your other classes. All right, so why am I going into all this? Because it's important to understand, if you're going to try cartoon animation, you have, to, you have to first back away from, you know, don't be the animator, and back away and think more like a filmmaker and say, um, is everything else going to play well with this? Is everything else going to work? Because if everything else doesn't work, then you can try and make the most wonderful cartoon animation and if you stick it in a world that doesn't work that way it, it feels disjointed okay um, so what are some examples I think a good example of a film that uh, that handles it about as well as you can is a short film that Pixar did presto pretty cartoony animation um, pretty cartoony, but not what I would call full Tom and Jerry or Warner Brothers, Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, um, Woody Woodpecker style cartoon animation. It's cartoony-ish, but there's a lot of aspects of the film. I mean, the, 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 the whole shading and rendering side of things, I mean, when you get down to Presto, if you watch it, you know, go ahead and pop in your DVD. I can't give you pictures because trademarks and all that garbage. But, you know, if you take a look at that film, all those elements 
are up here towards that realism side and the animation the motion is somewhere right around back in here okay but it's all on ones okay and this is a pretty big thing that you gotta analyze and understand um, when you get into those older you know night what, what, what we call kind of golden era cartoon animation uh, probably the height of that was probably the 1940s okay where you had um, you know Walter Lance studio you had the Warner Brothers stuff you had the Disney shorts you know the goofy stuff um, you had MGM with Tom and Jerry and and uh, Tex Avery's unit and stuff like that these all worked off of a type of animation style that definitely abstracted something that we don't abstract in CG animation and that is frame rate okay now the frame rate in CG it's 24 frames per second and it's very typical you set keys we animate every 20 every frame of those 24 is, is a new image okay by moving a character a little bit we get a different change what these guys did is they mixed ones and twos okay um, 24 frames is you know what you get for film animation and for the purposes of our conversation that's what we'll work with one second of film requires 24 frames to go by it doesn't matter whether you take the same image and shoot it 24 times or you shoot 24 new images that's what it takes to make a second of film in CG we will make 24 new images okay how do we make 24 new images we set a key here set a key here do whatever we do and the difference is if you change from one frame to the next if something changed in the character's movement it's a new image okay twos and this is what's called animating on ones all right animating on ones is real simple because it's a series of one image one image one image one image one image you only shoot that image you only expose that image to one frame of film okay shooting on twos is when you use 12 images and you shoot each one two frames you still get your 24 frames to get your one second but you used less motion to do it okay the result when looked at when it's drawn doesn't really bother us when it's used with stuff that has realistic shading that has realistic lighting uh, material and texture and shading and shadowing density that is leans more in the realistic realm than the abstract realm I mean when you draw it you, you immediately can't do too much super realistic shading because it's a drawing um, you do the ink and paint stuff like it's it's an ink outline so well, nothing in life has an ink outline um, when you do you know the the solid colors again you know the shadows might just be brush strokes underneath the backgrounds might be paintings it's very clear this isn't real and so it's real easy to get away with only 12 images the more expensive stuff would mix ones and twos which is really hard for some CG people to understand that in you know in that 24 frames to get the second they may have used 16 to 18 drawings or six you know images I call them drawings because that's what they did they made drawings in CG we make images all right every frame renders out as an image so it's kind of difficult in CG because a, a lot of CG animators have never understood this concept of mixing ones and twos. All right, the idea that for some movement you own you you would only use a few drawings, and then some faster movement or more complex movement you would mo use more drawings, but then you would back out. The, you know, hand drawn did this because it made sense. It was economical. Why draw every drawing if you didn't need to? Richard Williams being the common exception, but typical golden era 1940s cartoon animation is not typically animated full on ones not even Disney did full on ones all the time okay they were good but they weren't stupid all right um, so what do we got then we got an abstraction of motion all right you it, it's very hard to mix all these things 
that are over here in the realism side of things with an abstraction of motion. It just feels wrong. It feels broken. Okay, that's why when you have animation um, where you know if you look online or you look at people's work and you see um, they're moving holds are dead. All right, and if you take a look at um, you know the overlaps are stiff. All right, these are these are all pretty common things. Um, in motion, where you, you, you get a sense of like, okay, that just doesn't feel like it's got any quality. Well, it it just has to. If everything else in the scene is up here, you can't have dead holds, and you can't have stiff overlaps, and you can't have even spacing, um, and your ease in and ease outs can't. You know, your timing can't be as sharp uh, as like, bam. You can't do stuff like that because realism is saying it's like the subtle little pressure from the rest of the image from the modeling from everything else saying expect things to be filled out and it's not so much that detail is better and lack of detail is worse it's not it's just cohesiveness is better and lack of cohesion is worse so you can get away with all this stuff if everything else is similar okay I got a you know some examples of stuff that I've done I've got this little thing I did here a little while ago and it's very you know it's a little thing it's very abstract okay there's no world all right it's just a bunch of paintings in the background okay the characters are simple gumdrops with arms the shading is there's no shadows in it practically I don't think there's any shadows there's some some shading aspects to it but I mean we're not I, I, at no point in here was I trying to fool anybody into thinking that this is realistic in any way whatsoever I wasn't even trying to make it look like um, you know like a lot of times in CG it's pretty popular to emulate other other styles like stop-motion clay or puppetry where the you know the materials look like it's a puppet that's being made um, this right here I completely invented new materials that had no basis in reality whatsoever I just wanted something that looked graphical simple okay so there's no at no point in time do you ever believe that this kind of a character exists or this kind of a character exists it just I'm not I'm not even trying to go there at no point in time am I ever trying to convince the the viewer that this is a real place so because the painting in the background is all very abstract and because the character designs are very simplified and abstract because the shading in it is extremely abstract it's not realistic at all there's no shadows uh, it's like the characters are kind of self illuminated um, the and you know there is some subtlety some modeled aspects to the textures in here and the shapes and all these things everything visually just from a still gives you enough information to let you know hey we got a little bit of room here we can play with this all right we can we can do some things here motion wise that you couldn't do in you know a big full on more realistically styled typical cg film okay because all those things, you know, they, they're saying, they're putting on this pressure. Hey, expect something rich here. Expect something filled out. Whereas with this, if you step through it, I am mixing ones and twos a lot on this. Okay? I'm stepping through here. Here's a frame. And then I move here. All right? So, let's see. There's a frame there. A new drawing. But I don't move, you know, if I take another step, there's okay so there's one two three one frame two frames three frames but then four frames oops he didn't move five frames he didn't move six frames he's still not moving seven frames he finally moves so I'm mixing ones twos and threes basically it just means I'm some images I'm only showing for one frame some images I'm showing for two frames some images I get crazy and show for three sometimes even four frames meaning I don't feel a need to make him keep moving that's a dead hold my friends that is solid if you looked at the graph editor on this thing what you would see there is BAM 
nothing. It would go nowhere. All right, it's in step mode actually, um, and that's that's fine because the rest of the imagery is saying, hey, this is cool. We can do this. Don't don't expect realism here. And when you set the visual expectations to be less than realistic, you can get away with a lot of stuff. So here he holds this. Let's see, one frame, two frames. So so one holds it for one, holds it for one, holds it for one, two, three, four, then hits that and holds it for one, two, holds it for two, hits this one for one, two, three, four, and then hits that one for one, hits this one for one. Now I'm starting to do some weird things with the shapes. Okay, so I'm mixing ones, twos, threes, fours. There, so there's a one, there's a one, two, three, four, and then holds that for one, two, three, hits that for one, two, three, four, five. Hits this one for one, two, hits this one for one, hits this one for one, two, hits this one for one, 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 two, three, four, one, 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 two, three. You see what I'm doing as I'm counting it off? How long each of these unique changing images is held for is totally mixed up. Totally mixed up. And as a result, I can get away with some things that you cannot get away with if the whole world is saying expect everything to be filled on at once. If you took this same motion and applied it to Remy in Ratatouille, it would feel like something was broken. Okay, if you took the same mixture of, of how long each particular image was drawn for, it would feel visually har disharmonious because you got all these things that are so lush and filled out and it's good, it's beautiful stuff, it's fantastic stuff. I mean, I love watching it. And I, you know, it's actually kind of fun to make too, because you kind of get into the details and everything. But cartoon animation, you kind of have to learn to back off a bit and think far more abstract. But you really have to understand context, what's all around it. Okay, looking um, at this right here, here's an example, a close-up, just an isolation of uh, one of the motions. Uh, forgive the uh, crappy anti-aliasing. That's because the, the anti-aliasing is in the alpha channel. But if you take a look at this, there's one key. So we hold this for um, one, two, and hold that for one, two, hold that for one, two, three, hold that for one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, 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 two, well, that's a one, sorry, two, three, one, two, 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 one, two. So I'm on twos through a lot of this stuff. Okay, and this is very typical of what you'll find if you sit down and step through DVD of Warner Brothers shorts. You're going to find this same pattern kind of mixing back and forth. Is there a rhyme or reason to it? Kind of. Um, it's basically what does the motion need. Now, if you go back in through here, and kind of go back here and just, if we play it, there's a, there's some pretty interesting things going on. One, he, he goes from here to here, and he holds that, and then there's one frame. Now, aside from all the smearing and stuff like that, which we will get into in later videos, because it's really... once you, I can't really talk about smear stuff without first explaining the context in which it works, in which it doesn't work. So we'll get to a lot of these really extreme shapes and stuff. But one of the things that I want to do point out here in this video is because we are mixing the frame rates um, in really interesting ways, we can get away with this move right here, where it just goes from here to there to there in two frames, and it works. Okay, 
not only that, but his face is really pushed out and really exaggerated. You know, he's kind of scaled forward right there. And the reason why it works is because we're setting up the expectation that this isn't realistic. Uh, under no circumstances should you even think it's realistic. It's all abstracted. Okay. There are subtleties here. There's richness here. Okay. The textures are not just simple flat colors. The shading is not simple flat shading. Okay. There's a lot of gradients going on in here. There's there's texture variety in here. There's a there's some edge shading going on. I mean there's there's some there's some really neat stuff happening. And the design is simple, but it's not overly simple. I mean, if you take a look at this um, in silhouette mode, you see some pretty, pretty solid design fundamentals here, where you keep things very simple to read in the silhouettes. Okay, and the lines kind of play together really nice. You know, so it's it was all designed to work graphically, okay? So you have you have this aspect of it where, where things are kind of mixing and matching together that has to be visually harmonious. And by doing this, it allows me to kind of snap right there and bam, you you can't do that. It's very hard to do that. I, mean, I won't say can't. Uh, I will say it's very hard to do that in a more typical in a Shrek kind of world, okay? Um, it's just because that kind of world is expecting this to get filled out, okay? And you, would, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't dream of doing it in two, literally two frames, okay? Boom, boom. But here it can work because it's more about energy, more about shape. Um, the, the detail of the motion is subservient to the energy of the motion, okay? Which is understanding where the contextual hierarchy of what your motion needs to be. Go back and, and if you want to, with these understandings, start firing through and framing through um, your animation libraries, you know, your whichever ones you like. You know, I, I like studying Woody Woodpecker because the stuff they did with Woody Woodpecker was absolutely insane. I mean, they were doing things with him that's just like, that doesn't make it. I don't even know how you think like that. Um, at least I didn't. And a lot of CG animators today have a hard time getting their head. They can watch and they can enjoy it, but if they stop, if you kind of like, okay, stop becoming a fan, stop becoming an audience, and start becoming a student and study it, it will blow your mind at how those guys could even think like that. Um, because we're not used to thinking that way. We're used to thinking of motion needs to be filled out and we are always filling out the blanks. Whereas this kind of animation, it's about what you don't put in as much as what you do put in. And what you're letting the audience's imagination fill in versus what you're filling in. CG animation, CG in general, has been about removing areas of, in, of, of ambiguity or inaccuracy. Inaccuracy is probably a thing, but inaccuracy is a terrible word because the concept with the word of inaccurate is to say that there is an objective accuracy. All right. So we've, for a long time in CG, said, well, that's an inaccurate representation of shadow. Real shadows are more like this. Well, then that means by just the very framework of how we view our work, we are saying that realism is right. And that's not always true in animation. In fact, I would tend to say that it's less true in animation. Now, of course, if you're working with visual effects films, you're putting things in there. But I'm not a big believer that realism is right. I think realism is realism. And it serves its purpose when everything else is in that realm. I don't like the term, think in terms of inaccurate or that's not right. It's more about contextual harmony, visual harmony, cohesiveness of how everything works. Realism is not right. Realism is an option. Okay, and if realism is an option, then unrealism is an equally valid option. Okay, it's really important to understand. So. Don't try and take an unrealistic shoe and fit it into a realistic onto a realistic foot. 
or vice versa. Don't try to take a realistic foot and fit it into an unrealistic shoe. It won't fit well. Um, you know, Jesus has an expression, a parable in the, in, in the Bible. He says, you don't take new wine and put it into old wineskins. Because old wineskins are stiff and they don't flex. And new wine ferments and needs room to expand. You put new wine into new wineskins. He's, he's basically saying there's wisdom and understanding context. You have to put things contextually cohesive together. Okay? You, this is where we're at with cartoon animation. If there's anything you take away from our first video here, which we're wrapping up right now, if there's anything you take away from this, and it's the bedrock of everything we're going to talk about in the, in the ensuing months as we go into this stuff, it is that context is eh, king. Okay? When it comes to any type of animation, whichever style you want to work with, you can, I can even put, you know, style context if you want. But it all relates to that list of uh, elements, you know, character design, world design, um, material and textures. You can even break it down even more. You can get into visual effects, um, all these things. The rules of gravity, uh, you know, these these are all things that, that are uh, important to understand. You know, kind of uh, an example of... Uh, Kind of like an example of of a film that you know again getting back to Presto, where we had, uh, you know that that nice little short that Doug Sweetland did with with uh, with Pixar, is they had very cartoony motion. Okay, but they couldn't get as cartoony as they wanted to, and also some cartoony acting as well but not as far as they wanted to because it was weighted on ones okay so you couldn't be abstract with the motion um, the gravity was very much realistic okay stuff fell and moved and floated and all these other things like that with a sense of weightiness gravity didn't you weren't they weren't playing with the physics of the world very much they were doing pretty implausible things you know a ladder shooting through a hat and magic hat and stuff okay that's a cartoony concept but the execution of it um yeah they had some slippery feet and they had some flurries of motion and there's a lot of attention paid to um what i will call technical aspects uh you know arcs spacing silhouettes these are all they were definitely pushed very stylized um but they were weighted very much in a world that had more or less had realism as its defining um i guess you would call it construct all right because of the lighting the shading now the character design was a little loose but the magician himself while stylized was he, he was you know not as cartoony as say um donald duck okay because donald duck is not shaped like a duck okay there's no duck that's shaped like donald duck there's no you know there's no it just doesn't happen but he's also not shaped like a person all right totally totally different kind of thing here whereas the magician maestro and presto is very much yeah you know the silhouette of him is it, it's it's definitely artistic but it's definitely not too far off either okay somewhere where on that realm where on that sliding scale from abstract to realistic okay he he certainly doesn't look like um the simplistic characters that you would get from say uh, inspector clouseau from uh the pink panther cartoons okay which is very much in, done in that uh kind of upa styling if you ever look for pink panther stuff online uh you'll see the the inspector clouseau character um clouseau sorry Jacques Cousteau, Inspector Clouseau. It's all the same to me, I guess. <laughs> Sorry to you French folks. I know I'm probably just meshing this up, but uh, if you take a look at his, he's just like basically a nose with a trench coat, right? Okay, that is not the, the maestro. Okay, so he's this realism defining construct with the lighting, the shading, the texture de density, the, the, the modeling representation of the shapes of the characters, um, the acting, while broad is not as broad as um, Sylvester 
you know, the cat in a Warner Brothers short trying to find a can opener in the drawer. Um, you know, it's it's certainly cartoonier than, say, Monsters, Inc., and probably quite a bit cartoonier than anything else they've ever done, but it's still not really close to the level of being push cartoony wise as a typical run of the mill Warner Brothers 1940s Bugs Bunny short film. And that's because there's so many aspects of the execution which are still very much defined in that realistic Pixar house style. I'm not saying it's bad. Remember, realism is an option. Okay? So that's fine. They took that option and they ran with it and they executed it perfectly, wonderfully. It's all very cohesive. It works. It's pleasing. It's satisfactory. In many realms, it's wonderful work. Okay? But on the realm from, you know, the abstract cartoony to the realistic not so cartoony, it's still more on this end of the scale than it is on this end of the scale. It's not it's not down here, okay? It's close to here, the center, but it's still on this end of things because of things like the frame rates and all the things I talked about, okay? And that's just the choice they make. It's totally fine. The perfect thing about it is it all works in this it's all very cohesive. The stuff all works in a fairly tight band along this realm and nothing strays too far from anything else so we buy it as a whole we accept the entire thing as a flavor for what it is and we enjoy it we can do that down here too okay and so that's what we're going to explore how to do that how to push the boundaries how to do some things quote unquote wrong because we've been told that everything up here is right and anything that doesn't fit up here is somehow inferior or broken that's not necessarily true just anything that's not up here has to be cohesive, just like anything up there is. Okay, so there's our there's our first conversation. More lecture, concept, theory. Um, hopefully, this is kind of interesting stuff to you. Um, I've been fascinated by this stuff for probably about the f past six, five or six years now of my animating career, um, because you know there's a part of me that's like there's a whole style of animation that has not been represented in this computer graphics realm and I and I don't at to, at the time I didn't when I started doing this I was like is it even possible is it even plausible is it even reasonable to expect that it could happen and so really I've just been kind of plunking away and I've taught this style of animation now in my APT class to probably half a dozen students and I I can tell you right now it works but it has to be cohesive okay so there you go it's a great way to kick off 2010. I'm excited about these videos, man. They're they're, they're fun. They're going to be I'm going to have so much fun putting this stuff down. And hopefully you guys enjoy them too. You learn a lot and you know opened your eyes to different possibilities and you too can start exploring and trying different things. And again, don't be afraid to make mistakes, man. I got so many mistakes in figuring this stuff out. Explore, you know. I I, I don't have all the answers here. I can tell you what I have found and give you my opinions on them some, some things. But I think there's more to be found out there. So find it. Okay? So if these take these videos as a jump off point and say, Yeah, let's do this. This is cool. So I'm real excited about this. Probably the most excited I've been about doing VTS videos in a long time. Uh so it's good stuff. Two thousand ten is gonna be a rocking year, all right? So um as any as any time I say, give me some feedback or, you know, whatever, and I'll see you next month, man.